got a video on electric step and touch potential. Thank you for remembering that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I can see it. Yeah. All right, yeah. Yeah. Don't have any audio there. No audio. Yeah. Well, there it goes. There it just started. Welcome to Tech Talks Engineer Channel. Today we will see what is step and touch potential. It can be understood with very basic knowledge of electricity. As we know, current flows from high potential to low potential. Also, current flows through least resistance path. With these two basic concepts, step potential and touch potential can be understood easily. Let's take an example. Consider current carrying conductor is broken and touches ground, or accidentally some big crane or excavator touches overhead current carrying conductor. In such conditions, potential of the ground at the point where the broken conductor touches increases and decreases with distance from the touch point. Hence, we can see that potential near touch point is higher and lower at distant points. We can say that invisible rings of potential get formed around the touch point. Each ring has different potential in decreasing manner. Let's consider that due to the broken conductor, potential at the touch point is 20 kV. Therefore, let's assume potential of the invisible rings to be 18 kV, 16 kV, 14 kV and so on. If one walks on this affected area, the person would experience an electric shock. Because while taking steps, one foot gets on one ring let's say on the ring with potential of 14 kV and other foot on the other ring with potential of 16 kV. This creates potential difference of 2 kV between two legs, causing current to flow through body from high potential ground to low potential ground. The cause in this case person's body is low resistance path for current to flow than the ground. This is the cause of electric shock due to step potential which can be fatal. Now how to be safe and avoid such electric shock due to step potential. As we saw, current flows due to potential difference between two legs as one takes step to walk. Don't you worry, here comes Bunny to your rescue. Bunny <laughs> is the way one can get out of the affected area due to broken conductor. Keep shuffling or bunny hopping with both the legs lifting up and putting down together and not one by one until one gets out of the affected ground completely. Get at least 10 meters away from the touch point by bunny hopping. Also remember not to jump too high. To check whether one is inside affected area, shuffle out foot gradually keeping it in contact with ground. If inside affected ground, the person would feel tingling sensation in legs due to potential difference. That means furthermore bunny hopping is required to get out of the danger zone, safely. Now let's understand touch potential. If one touches high potential conductor or an object, current flows through the person's body to the ground, body being the low resistance path for current to flow. Kent's body experiences electric shock which can be fatal. Therefore the way to avoid touch potential is to avoid touching such object with electric potential, for example electric poles, conductors etc. So guys this is all about step potential and touch potential. Hope you like the video. If yes please hit the like button and comment. For more videos please subscribe. Thank you. Thank you. Albion Online is a sandbox MMORPG. Not bad. No problem. All right, could you unshare there for us? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Caribou, anything you'd like to add to that? Um, or explain? I was hoping to see if that information is accurate. Uh, they didn't really go in much detail with touch potential either. Okay. Uh, electric stuff. Well, hold on one second. Another one on that. First, uh, first and foremost, yes, that information is very accurate. Let me let me go ahead and state that now. Uh, hold on a second.
there is one out there that I'd like to show you also. Here it is. Ads, ads, ads. Okay. That was a very good explanation on touch potential. We're gonna move over, I mean, excuse me, step potential, kind of short on the touch. So I'm gonna go share a little bit more about the touch potential. Let me know when you've got a share there. Got it. Okay. So you step and touch, I mean, touch potential can actually go through through underground wires also. It is not just a vehicle, equipment, or object that could be energized. Everything within a 10 meter radius of the contact could also be energized. So he's got the truck here showing the truck and he's made contact with the uh, dump part of the truck up in the power lines. You would think that a rubber tire would be a good insulator to that. Why do, why do tires not factor into this? What are tires made of? Steel belts. Steel belts. Yeah, there Steel you belts. Go. They're rubber. They're not, they're not a good insulation rubber. They're meant rubber for the road. And they are got steel belts in them. So that's why, really, tires on a vehicle are not a good insulator. That's why you have to be aware of both step and touch potential. With step potential, electricity spreads like ripples or rings over the surface of the ground away from the point of contact. Each ring carries a different voltage. If you step into one ring while your foot is in another, the electricity will make up the difference in voltage through your body. With touch potential, if someone on the ground touches what is in contact. Now, obviously the way this should be in effect is the boom of the uh, track hoe hits a power line where should electricity be flowing as far as least resistance? Where through? The tracks or the man? What are the tracks made out of? I imagine some sort of steel. Steel, yeah. Steel. steel. But that's not to say that if it comes in contact with the truck, some of it's going through the steel, that if you make touch contact or touch potential, there's a difference between you and the track hoe that some of that electricity may travel through you. So that's your touch potential. Back with the power line, electricity will travel to the person's body. If you hit the power line, it's supposed to break the vehicle free of the convoy. You can safely break from the contact move the vehicle or equipment at least 10 meters away to safety. If you must exit the vehicle, only in the case of a fire, jump away from the equipment with two feet together, then bunny hop or shuffle at least 10 meters away from the equipment, feet together, then but only in the case of a fire, jump away from uh, we'll get right here, that thing's going kind of fast. The vehicle, only in the case of a fire. Okay, you'll notice right here, gentlemen, don't hold on to the vehicle and then step on the ground. That includes your car too. Because as soon as you do that, what do you, what's the difference? What kind of potential do you have? It's a touch potential. Right, right. The ground oh, point. Yeah, it, see the handle that he's got on the side to get up in the truck right here? If I hold onto that, mm -hmm. step onto the ground, now you've got touch potential. You got to keep your hands by your side and then jump out of the vehicle. It's kind of hard to do in a car, but you can't make contact with the car and the ground at the same time. Jump away from the equipment with two feet together, then bunny hop or shuffle at least 10 meters away from the equipment. Don't take large steps, as there is the potential for electrical current traveling through your body. If you're not sure you're far enough away, slowly move your feet apart. If you feel a tingling sensation in your legs, you are still within the step potential zone and must continue to bunny hop or shuffle away. 
Okay, so I mean, Mr. Carabo was, uh, was asking, is this for real? What do you think, Professor V? Absolutely. It is for real. And uh, with you working in a utility industry, the potential for it to happen is much, much, much greater. Uh, some of the things that the situations that I've run to, especially uh, working for Santee, <laughs> a lot of your trouble calls might be at night down in the woods. And of course, if you got power out, the first objective for you to do is go out and patrol the line to see if there's any problems on it to uh, determine what the problem is. Have I stepped up towards the power line and been close to it while it's been laying on the ground? Yes. And you're able to feel it in your feet and through the bottoms of your feet. As soon as you do that, do an about face. I know it looks kind of dumb. Hop away. Um, it doesn't take much to get the heart into, into defibrillation and uh, for your heart to stop. So that is a true concept. Now, you think out there, the, well, aren't there fuses? Aren't there protective devices that are out there so this, to prevent this to happen? Yes, there are. But some of them do not work in all cases because of the resistance of the ground that the power line has fallen on. So that voltage is traveling, especially down at the beach. What, what's, what's the beach made out of? Sorry. Water. Sand. And what's, what's, uh, what's glass made out of? Sand. sand and glass is a great insulator so you get a power line laying on sand it has a high resistance value and it may not trip or operate protective devices so when you approach power lines when you approach equipment and you know this is i've seen it happen before where uh, crane operators or track operators have gotten a boom up into a power line what is the if the piece of equipment is not on fire or you don't have any problems with the equipment, what are you supposed to do? This includes a motor vehicle also. Stay in it. Stay inside. Stay inside that piece of equipment. Uh, include your bucket truck. If you've got a line truck and you're up on those pieces of equipment and something comes in contact with the power line, do not get off that piece of equipment unless there's an emergency or something wrong with it, it's burning. Any other questions there? Good video. All right, and that is something, guys, to remember from here on out. You see any kind of power line. 7,200 volts, transmission, distribution, 12240, and you approach it, immediately hop away until you determine that line has been de-energized before you start approaching it again. Any other thing you'd like to add there, Professor V? Yeah, I mean, really, in my experience, I mean, so many times I've been on, um, Spent a lot of where the widening that highways, road constructions are notorious for putting a dump truck or some kind of piece of machinery up in the primary or that, you know, in those conductors burning it down, falls across the vehicle. If it's not, you know, shooting sparks or, you know, an arc on it or something, you have really no way of knowing whether it's energized or not. Um, went to one down next to Kingsburg, guy put the dump truck in it. It blew out all the tires on it. Um, it blew out the headlights on the truck and the guy sat in the cab of the truck till I got there. I was probably, I don't know, 30, 35 minutes away and that kind of halted things on the scene. But the minute I got there, I checked and made sure the line was de-energized. That gentleman got out of his truck and um, started walking towards his house. He quit right there on the spot. So. Be aware of that, you can't see it. A lot of times you can't hear it. Um, went to a down power line and it was in a sandy area like Professor Schumacher said. I had no idea whether it was energized or de-energized, could not tell, did not know. So I had to go and I actually came in from the back side of it. So I had no way of knowing whether it was energized because I wasn't gonna get close to it or de-energized. So I had to go, um, uh, find a device that um, controlled the, you know, the power going through that area, verified it was still energized, had to de-energize it before we could do anything to a very, very dangerous situation. Mm -hmm. Seen it fall in the highway before, a feeder. It was near the end of the feeder. It actually melted the asphalt. It did not lock out or go out. It had, it had a river of a 
of aluminum flowing down the highway because it was so hot. So, I mean, guys, just don't just assume something's dead because you can't tell. Don't put your hands on it, whether you got your rubber gloves on or not. I mean, you're, you're walking into a very dangerous situation. Mm -hmm. You should have a shared drawing up here. You do. Uh, and, you know, I've seen instances of this before, and we're going to tell you more times than one, you know, your work is going to be in a general location where you're working at down here in the ground. And this guy is working with a crane guy. And he's getting ready to pick up a big old box over here. Is always look up. Yeah. Be aware of your surroundings. You're gonna you're gonna be working around power lines a lot. Always look up and make sure the clearances are maintained. And I've seen you know times down there in the boulevard with new hotels and new builds where a crane operator you know has got his boom up here. This guy's not paying attention. All he's worried about is getting the hook on this load down here, and that. Uh, he either pulls it or moves it, <clears throat> moves that cable into the power line. Well, where's electricity going? His touch potential. Right, his touch potential. As soon as he grabs that hook to hook up to the load and it moves into the power line, it's going bo through both the crane and him. <clears throat> Just be aware of your surroundings up there and know your environment that you're working in. Uh, Professor V? Yes. And we'll give one more example here. I've seen guys drive into substations and not look up. Have you seen ever seen a, a fleet to drive into a substation just to make contact with the bus or power line? I have not. I, I have before. You know, you get in emergency situations where you need to restore power. The, the actual intention here is slow down, know your environment, and know your clearances. But look up, look down, look around. Don't just think everything's good to go when you're going somewhere. That's right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, unless there's anything else or any more questions, we'll go ahead and get into math. Okay. All right, gentlemen. If you've got your book with you, we are section six. We are in section six. And unit 26, that's on page 130. Um, we left off last week with estimates and uh, averages and combined problem process and those kinds of things. So uh, we're going to move into unit 26 and we'll see a quiz today. Uh, so unit 26, page 130, if we're ready, uh, basic principles of length and measure, length or Length measure or linear measure first to straight line measurement. Uh, linear measurement is one dimensional. So um, in the utility industry, where it, whether it's an uh, electric utility or a telephone company, cable company, um, we, we put things in the air from pole to pole. We put conductors um, underground. We bury, you know, bury, it's either buried or it's either um, aerial. So you have to know footage you have to know um, if some if you're putting in some conduit and somebody says cut me off a piece of conduit so many feet and so many inches you need to know what the feet and inches are um, and know how to really know how to read a ruler guys if you if you don't know how to read a ruler take the time um, to look at it and get a good ruler and it'll tell you the inches it'll tell you if it's, you know, three quarters of an inch, a half an inch, quarter inch, five eighths of an inch and get those kind of, those figures in your head. But we're gonna look at length of measure if you're on page number. Um, and I'll say this before we go into that part of it, metric, the metric system, um, there's not a whole lot of metric system being used in our industry, not at least on the Duke side. And I don't believe very much metric is used you know, in other utilities, um, Santee Cook or Santee Electric as well, you might have some guys come in from another part of the country and they know, um, you know, meters and all that kind of stuff. But we generally stick to inches, feet, yards, miles, those kind of measurements. But everybody knows if you look on page 131 that there's uh, 12, 12 inches, there's 12 inches in a foot, okay? 
you have three feet equal one yard. You've got 1,760 yards in a mile, and then you have 5,280 feet in one mile. And guys, I want you to remember that, especially the mileage, uh, 5,280 feet and 1,760 yards are in one mile. Uh, you may see those numbers again at some point, but just remember that we do not use um, the metric system. Now, now you saw it in the video, they said that you need to get away 10 meters. So 10 meters is roughly 30 feet. May is probably a little over 30 feet, but it's roughly 30 feet. Um, anybody got any questions about measurement, feet, inches, those kinds of things? It was, we're gonna zip through this. That's just pretty easy. Um, any comments about it? Anything that you've learned about it differently? Just, just one from me, Professor V, when you say 1,760 yards, yes. 5,280 feet in one mile, the industry out there as far as, uh, especially when you're doing <laughs> overhead conductors, when, they, uh, when you have reels of wire, yep. you either try to go either in halves or holes of a mile. So you, you'll be able to pull a mile at a time. That's why we emphasize knowing that footage right there. And the reels that you're going to be looking at of wire that you're going to be loaded up have this on the reel. So if, if the uh, design asks for where you're going to pull one full mile of overhead conductor, make sure you have how many feet on the reel. 5280. 5280. Wow. Plus Call what? Say 10, 10%. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So another, uh, what? 520. Uh, yeah, so yeah make 500, sure around, yeah. Right. Make sure you have around 5,600 because some of it's going to, you're going to need in scrap. That's all I had to add, Professor B. All right. I thank you for that. Any guys, you got anything else about feet, inches, miles? And just remember, too, guys, that um, if you go work, uh, a lot of crews are. They work both overhead and underground, so they'll do um, underground. They'll have to install conduit or that funny pipe um, as well. Um, most conduit comes in either 10 foot sections or 20 foot sections. So if they tell you to load up, you know, uh, 400 feet of two inch conduit and there's 20 foot sections. So you, you just need to know how to figure um, what that would be. So somebody tell me how many. How many sticks of conduit am I going to have if it's 20 foot six? Well, say it again. It would it be 12? Would you, how many seconds you say? You need, if you, got, you need 200 feet of conduit and they're 20 foot sections, how much you got to have? Oh, 10. Yeah, correct. Okay. Very good. Yeah. So you know, I'm just going to draw something out here real quick. And we haven't done this in a good while. Uh, re you, and remember, uh, huh? Thank you. Uh, uh, remember out there, guys, when an engineer comes out to a job site, he's going to stand here prior to it being constructed. He's going to stand here and he's going to pull out his wheel and he's going to wheel off from point A to point B. And he's going to say, nah, 300 feet, that's how much conduit and wire I need. What is he not counting? All I that extra ten percent. All I see is the attendance. Yeah, attendance data screen. Oh, oh, I'm sharing the wrong screen then. Hold on. Give me a chance. There you go. How about that? That's it. That's better. <laughs> He's got a forty foot pole. Here's ground level right here. He's standing on it. He wheels off from point A to point B, and he says, "Yep, well, I need three hundred feet of conduit, and I need three hundred feet of wire." Well, what is he missing here? 10%. What, uh, what else? How deep he has to go. How deep he has to go. 40 feet up the pole. 40 feet up the pole. How deep he has to go. He has to come back up. He has to come into this transformer. And you got to leave a little slack out, too. See, you know, always at 300 feet, that's more than 10%. I can tell you right there. Right. Absolutely. 
the always, you know, you get somebody who says, yeah, somebody steps it off in 300 feet increments. Oh, and I, I do want to do step t- stepping to Professor V. Uh-huh. Does it always take, well, ask the engineer. So he needs like 396 feet there? I don't know. I haven't done the math. Always ask ahead of time, you know, did you give enough to go up the pole and how much we need to bury and how much we need, you know, always ask that question before you take off. So if you said 396, I'd probably pump it up to 400. All right. The other thing is, and this is going to happen a lot of times out there in the world, you're going to go out to a job site. Let's start a new one. Or you're going to run into a treble call. And let's say I've got a pole here. And here's some wire that comes down to my house. Hooks up to my house right here. How do I know you're not going to carry a wheel on your truck? And all of this is chewed up by squirrels. It comes down. I need to replace this whole span in this area right through here. What's a good basic way that I could find out what the length of this wire is? From the distance from the house to the pole? Yeah. Uh, Use your feet and walk it. Use your feet and walk it. What is the typical gate? When I say gate, that's how much power you're, of a of a six foot tall person. Three feet. Three feet. Excellent. Okay, that is a good way. So I start stepping right here. Now don't change your normal walk procedure. You walk one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I took ten steps to get from here to here. How far should it be? Thirty feet. 30 feet. And I need how much more? Three. Three. Let's go ahead and say when it's all said and done and over with, 40 feet. That's going to happen a lot out there in the world. Why did I add so much to it? Just to be safe. Just to be excellent. Thank you very much. What's the difference in 10 feet of wire? All right. Nothing. Yeah, nothing. Ain't nothing. That that's from better than splicing. Yeah, that's better here, and it's better than not having it when you get done. So uh, this is burnt down. I call my friend at the warehouse, uh, Samuel Carabo, and I say, Sam, hey man, I need you to pick up forty feet of one out triplex. Well, how did you determine that number? By stepping off and giving some extra right there. Don't do this. Step it off. I need thirty feet. No, you don't. You need 40. Okay, add that to him. Don't make him assume that. Okay, Professor B. I just got more questions about that, about, you know, inches, feet, yards, those kinds of things. Okay, very good. Let's move on. Let's move on to what time is it? 9.30. We good? Uh, 9.30. Page 140. Let's look at area measure, and uh, we're just going to talk a few minutes about that. Uh, if we need to figure, we've got a, uh, let's just say, a, a box, and it's 12, 12 inches length, 12 inches wide. What's the area for that box? Anybody? 144. How'd you get that? 12 times 12. Times 12. Okay, area by width, area by length, okay. width by length, length by width. Very good. Um, that goes for square feet as well. Um, if you've got uh, nine square feet, so nine by nine, what's that going to give us? 81. 81. 81 square feet. Okay. I mean, that's pretty cut and dry. Just, just remember. Um, if, if they're asking for the, the square feet of a, a, ro- a room or box, and of course, electricians like to figure that for load in a room, uh, as far as lighting or receptacles. Um, but of course, you know, we're not electricians. We're, we're, we're going to be linemen. So we really don't have to worry about that kind of thing, but just to, just to say that we've gone through it. So. Uh- uh, before you before you carry on there, you know, we, we give the basic stuff here and uh, of doing math and whatnot, but I've seen this happen before. When you say, let's see, that was uh, 81 square feet. 
Yep. You see how I'm writing this out, guys? That is 81 square feet in an answer. Huh. That is not mm -mm. 81 squared feet. No. 81 SQ feet. Yes, that is the correct answer. I've seen answers come like this sometimes. That is not correct. Here I am, I wavered, son. All right. Does anybody have any questions or anything they wanted? That's pretty quick stuff to go through there, guys. I mean, um, okay. we can roll on, or you want to, Professor Shoemaker, the next um, unit is 31, and that's the basic principles of ratios. You want to? Yeah, let's take a break before we start that because we're going to delve in that pretty hard. Okay, it's 9.34, so what, 9.45? Sounds like a plan, man. All right. Seven. How did you determine that number? Uh, 210 divided by 30. Okay. 210 divided by 30 oh. equals seven. That should be your reading on the uh, primary side of the transform. Is there any questions there thus far? Because we're going to be getting into this a good bit with different types of voltages. Um. I heard an um. Oh, so um, earlier on the question with the 7,200 volts and the 480 volts, we times we times the three and the 15, we were finding what? Secondary amps. Secondary amps on the three. Right. Okay. Gotcha. The first thing you got to do when I'm asking for this ratio question is figure the ratio first. Mm -hmm. 480 divided by 7200 mm -hmm. equals 15. Right. That's the bottom number. Put a one up top. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. If I ask for this number, I've got to provide this number, 300. When you're going up in the calculation, you divide. 300 divided by 15 equals what? 20. 20. Yeah. 20. Excellent, guys. Excellent. Whenever I provide you a number up at the top, let's do this over here on the side. Seven amps. Question mark, how many amps? The first thing you need to figure is what? Ratio, which is? One, one to 30. Every time you go down in your calculation, you need to multiply. Seven times 30. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Yeah, it's starting to click, isn't it? Yeah. <coughs> that answer will be 210. 30. All right. Okay, so now I'm going to turn you loose on one, a little bit different numbers. Nineteen thousand nine hundred. That's my primary voltage. My secondary voltage is two forty. If you come up with a decimal, that is okay. What is the first thing I need to figure? Ratio. What is the first ratio? Ratio. I'm going to take my 19,900. 79.16. And divided by 240. That gave me a what? 70. 9.16. 9.16. What do I put up top? One. One. I have 42 amps on the primary side how many amps do i have on the secondary side 42 times 
Three thousand three hundred twenty-four. Three thousand three hundred twenty-four. Point seven two. Point seven two. Okay, one more, and then we're going to go into the wattage end of it. We just found the uh, secondary, right? That's correct. Okay. Yep. Primary, as far as drawings and voltages, and the transformer location is always going to be on top. Secondary always comes out of the transformer below. Okay. Now okay. I got a question. Yes, sir. I own, uh, so we're supposed to divide the 19,900 by the 240, right? Correct. I got like 82 point something whenever I did it. All right, hold on a second. I'll double check. 82.91. <laughs> Who gave me the 79.16? Hold on, I'll check. Let's see. I got the same thing, 82. 900 divided by 240 equals 82.916. That's what I thought. So we might as well just scratch all this. That's bad information. File, new. Save 19,900. V, V. 80. 2.91, that's sufficient. We're going to the hundredth. One, I'll give you a new amperage right here, 26. Times 82.91 is gonna give me my secondary amperage, which is? 2,155. 2,155, and I heard another answer there. 0. 0.8. 0. 0.8. Okay. Just a double check here. Is everybody up to speed how we got this process and how we got this number down here at the bottom? Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Where did, where did uh, the 26 come from? Where the 26 come from? I gave it. Gave it. That's a measurement I took. I've got to give you some kind of information. You've got to take some kind of measurement. To get the secondary? Mm, excuse me? Is that to get the secondary, correct? That is correct. Okay, I see. If you want to double check yourself and make sure everything's correct, divide 2155.8 by 82.91. That's a good double check on your work. Two, one, five, five, point eight, divided by eight, two, point nine, one, equals 26.00. That was a check on my work, good to go. All right, I'm gonna flip it one time. My primary voltage is 4,800 volts. My secondary voltage is 120. Figure the ratio. 40. 40. 40 times 120 equals 4,800. I'm going to put my 40 here. This remains 1. My secondary amps, I'm giving you this number, it's just an arbitrary number, is 26. How many amps are on the primary side? 1,040. Yeah, 1,040. 1,040? Yep. When you go down in your calculation, I'm looking for this number down here, you multiply. When I'm going up in the equation, I need to divide. I got like 1.53. There we go. 40 divided by 26 equals? 25. 26. 40. Uh, one, I got 1.53. 1.53 your answer. 
you gotta you gotta watch out for direction here guys when i give you the value of amperage i gotta give you one value of amperage if i'm going up i divide oh if i'm going down if i give you the top amperage here and i'm looking for the amperage on the secondary side i've got to multiply by whatever the ratio is. Any questions there? Any concerns? Do you want to do a couple more? <laughs> yeah, I'd like to do a couple. Yeah. Sure, sure, no problem. Uh, 2,400 volts primary. This, this will make it look easy on you guys. 240 volts secondary. What's the ratio? 10. Yeah, that's an easy one. One to 10. 10 times 240 equals 2,400. I've got 10 amps on the primary side. How many amps do I have on the secondary side? 10 times 10. 100. 100, there's your answer. Okay, watch this. I'm gonna leave those same numbers up there. Still the one, to, it, it stays. Transformer is built this way. The ratio stays the same. I've got 100 amps on the secondary side. How many amps do I have on the primary side? Now I'm gonna go divide. 10. 10, there you go. 100 divided by 10 equals 10. Okay, don't get your amperage numbers and your ratio numbers mixed up. Transformers come pre-built in this way. You're not gonna find a transformer that has a ratio that's completely strewn out. Right? That voltage has to match the primary voltage that's on my system. This voltage has to ma match the voltage that I'm gonna be using in my home or business. So those are not gonna change. What is gonna change is when I'm using power in my house, that amp value is gonna go up and down as needed. You need to determine, well, if I take that <coughs> secondary amperage and know the ratio, this, was, this should be the primary amperage or vice versa. I'm going two directions here. If I know the primary amperage, then this should be on a good transformer, my secondary amperage. Okay, we'll do one more. What time is it, Professor V? It is 11, uh, 10 14. I'm moving along time wise. Yep. All right. Uh, all right, here we go 19,900. That's my primary voltage. My secondary voltage is 480 volts. 19,900. 41.4. Divided by 480. 41.4. Okay, that's 41.4. That number always goes at the bottom. Go up it at the top. One. For every one amp that travels through here, I'm gonna have 41.4 amps on the bottom. One times 41.4 equals 41.4. If I double that number, it's two times 41.4. Three amps, three times 41.4. You see where I'm headed here? Okay, that's all the down measurements right here. That'll tell me what's going on down here at the bottom. Vice versa, if I've got, and here goes the rest of the question. If I got 1,000, 70 amps on the bottom, how many amps do I have on the primary side? Now I'm asking you to do what? 
Divide. Divide. What's 1,070 divided by 41.4? 25.8. Yeah, 25.8. 25.8. There's your answer. Okay. You'll see some questions on the test about that. It's, you know, obviously I got to give you word questions and I'm going to go ahead and let me go ahead and get that up. Here. I might ask it in a different fashion, but quizzes. All right, quiz three. And this is how you should be writing it down when you see this word question. File, no, not so. A transformer primary voltage is 7,200. I'm reading right off the question on the quiz today. The secondary voltage is 240. What's the ratio of the voltages? Hard. Almost. Is it 30? Yes, 30. Be careful. It's one to 30. Okay. The number by itself is not a ratio. The two numbers together are. Okay, all right, not much more sense. Okay, so you okay. put the one up there. There you go. Okay. okay. So that that's an actual quiz question, worded. I, it, I'm not don't have the drawings up there. So that's a worded. Just go along with the question. And me, I, if I take a math question, I did math with my grandson last night. That was a zoo. Uh, just write down the numbers as they come out. Seventy two hundred. 240 and you'll notice I draw them top over bottom. If I was actually put that in there, I know I'd have to divide. Right. I'd have 30. I always put a one at the top. Mm. Bang, bang. One to 30 is your ratio. Okay. Mm. All right. That's a lot to soak in your brains in a short amount of time. It's 1019 by my book. Let's give it about 10. We'll be back at 1030. All right, take a break. Okay, I should uh, have a share screen up there, Professor V. That's it. Okay. All right, gentlemen, you'll see in this picture right here, it's a good example. I'll, sh I'll show you another one here of a transformer with primary on the top and then secondary coming out of these bushings on the... Uh, Let's see, make it real big, right here in the front. So the top, and I've got another picture to show you. So the top bushings here on the transformer, I've got a primary voltage coming in. <coughs> you can tell the difference. You see how big this one is here at the top and how small these are at the bottom. That's a good indication, indication of a voltage change. I don't need that much insulation down here at the bottom. But what I want you to look at and see why we're going in, into this as far as math is concerned, is conductor size. Do you see how small the conductor size is here? And I'll, I'll go ahead and zoom this in to make it more visible to you. That looks to me about the size of a number two AAAC, probably about half the size of your pinky finger. It's small. And actually going through the entire switch, because it's a primary voltage, that's number four copper. That's even smaller. That's not even the size of maybe the size of half of a pencil. Comes down to the switch, goes through the uh, fuse. See this wire coming out the backside that goes to the top of the transformer. Now it's being transformed inside the transformer. We'll say this is 7,200, our primary voltage. And this is 120, 240 coming out of the transformer and going to our home. Now look at the difference in size. 
Is that conductor bigger going to our home? That's 120. That's neutral. That's 120. Is that conductor size bigger than the conductor that's coming into our transformer on the primary side? Yes or no? Yes. A smaller, right? All right. It looks, it looks uh, bigger. That all right, and I'll give you I'll give you some relativity here. I know you're looking at a screen. That give me a good example there, Professor V, of uh, if if you got a, just a regular Phillips screwdriver. Can mm -hmm. you see that video? Yeah, I've seen it. Go ahead. Yeah, if you got a regular Phillips screwdriver. Yeah. That copper coming into the switch is about the size of that screwdriver right there. That's fair. All right. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna flip the screwdriver over. The wire that's coming out is almost as big as the handle. You yeah. see the difference? Right. Mm -hmm. Four, one off. Okay. That's the difference in the two conductors. Why am I able to use a small conductor at a primary voltage, but have to use a bigger conductor at a secondary voltage? So you don't use as much power? More amps? You're trying to carry a longer distance? Yeah. No, this is here. I'm just going from the top of the pole down to the transformer. I think oh, okay. somebody in there said amperage. Remember when I gave the analogy of the water line pipe? Mm -hmm. All right. So oh, I've got so the amps went up. All right. And I'm going to throw a little math at you while not, while not uh, drawing it out here. I've got three amps. This is my primary <laughs> wire going into the switch. Three going through this pipe. My transformer is 7,200 volts input, 240 volts output. Trans amps are going to come out of the secondary side. Uh, 30? Three amps in. Well, 90? 90. Wow. Yeah, do your ratio. Three amps will go through this pipe easily. It's small. I've got to enlarge my pipe to get 90 amps through. See how the concept works here? Oh yeah. There you go. That, that's, that's one good way of showing it. Three amps can travel through here easily because it's a small pipe and it's a lower amp value. I've raised it to 90 through transformation. I've got to have a bigger pipe to get it through. Okay. I just gave it to you here on a primary to secondary voltage value. Think of the big picture here. I've got to get it all the way from where? Where did we start at when we started talking about this subject? Uh, 45 miles away. 45 miles, 45 miles, miles away. away. So that means I need to transmit at a higher voltage a transmission voltage to be able to get it all the way down to my residence 45 miles away. Now, do you think transmission in, in reality to be able to construct it and for expense, what size conductor can I use on my transmission lines? Do I want it to be a huge pipe at 240 volts? And I mean, that, that's to be able to get 240 volts 45 miles away to me, I'm going to have to have a pipe that's the size of a <laughs> three inch pipe. It's going to have to be huge. But if I transform it, if I raise my voltage, goes along with the rule, what happens to my amperage? Goes down. Goes down. down. Exactly. Now I can use a much smaller conductor to transmit from my generating station to my home. You see how the concept works. So I'm going to throw a math problem up here for you. It's going to disturb you a little bit. <laughs> this one's going to be fun, guys. Let's stop this share. I'm going to share another screen. Go to paint. Share. So let's look at the big picture. We've just been talking about transformers. I'm going to talk about all the way from the generating station. Don't say. 
What was the top, Professor V? Top voltage. Top voltage. Uh, what did I do with my pen? That was a 786. Yeah. You're talking about transmission? Yes, sir. 786, I believe, is what you said. Okay. So my transmission line, here's my generating station. Going out, my transmission voltage is 708, excuse me. Control Z, Z, 786,000. One, two, three volts. I'm at home. My home uses 240 volts. It's kind of a cold day. I'm using 30 amps at my house. How many amps are on the transmission line? Don't overthink it right here. It's the simple math that we've been well, using. Would it be 109? Hold on a second. Don't don't go up, don't go thinking too hard about this. We've done <coughs> I need to answer this. Is it, uh... I got 98,250 amps. You multiplied it. I don't know if it's right, but I divided uh, 240 into 80, 78, or 786,000. And then 3275, then you multiplied it by 240? Yeah, that's what I did. I divided it. I don't know. Yeah, I, I divided it. Did you get 109 too? No, three thirty-two seventy-five divided by two forty. Uh, I got one oh nine. I got one oh nine. Got thirteen point six. I did seven eighty-six thousand divided by two forty, then divided by thirty. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, gentlemen, I'm back. Sorry for the interruption there. That was the big boss calling, so I need to take care of that. So I provided you with two voltage numbers, correct? Mm -hmm. Seven, eight, six, one, two, three, and 240. Well, don't overthink this. I just need the ratio between those two numbers. Um, one over 3,275. One over 3,275, 3, 3, correct? Yeah. Okay, yep. so I got 30 amps here. Now you got to watch the direction of the math. How many amps do I have on the 786,000 volt line? Now it's not three, it's three, two, seven, Five divided by 30. Right. Which is 109.1. No, can't be. It's got to be a decimal here. Look, look at the direction of my division. You're not taking 3275 and divide by zero, zero, 00916. All right. Go ahead and say that slowly because I was talking over you. Point zero zero nine one six. Wow. Look at that difference. I'm using 30 amps in my house. The transmission line has nine one thousandth of an amp on it. Huge, isn't it? 
And that's why you can have such a small or a skinny line traveling that far? It's going to be part of the smaller line conductor right here. But do remember, our transmission line coming out of the, uh, and I'll give you an example right here. Our transmission line is not feeding just one home, is it? Mm -mm. No, it's, no. Feeding, it's feeding tens of thousands of homes. So we'll use, we'll use some of the same numbers in math and going right here. Okay. And we'll so if, if this was a test, how would you ask this on the test? Like I would what would ask, be? My, my, I would ask, my transmission line is 786,000 volts. The volts at my house is 240 volts. I'm using 30 okay. amps in my house. How many amps are on the line? Okay, that's what I thought. Okay, all right. So we'll use this as a general rule of thumb. 30 amps feeds one house. That's kind of high, but we'll go ahead and use it. All right. How many houses can I run if my line will go up to 900 amps? Woo. 30. 30. 30 houses? 30 times 0 0.00916 will only take me to what? 0 0.027. It's gonna be 98,253 houses. There you go. How'd you get your math? Uh, I did 900 divided by 0 0.00916. There you go. If one, if that will feed one, how, how many? Will 900 feet, 98,253 homes. And really my conductor is still small. So that I just want you guys to get the concept of why we use high voltages and what happens to conductor size and construction. I mean, there's no way I would be able to get a conductor large enough to carry 98,253 homes built from Winya to my house 45 miles away. It's, it's not even feasible. The conductor would have to be huge. In order to do that, I've got to raise my voltage and my amperage does what? Lowers. Bound. Lowers, okay. One thing I do want you guys to remember Whatever happens on an electrical system regarding voltages and averages happens on the entire system. If I raise my voltage here, what will happen to my amperage here? It's going to go down. Exactly. If I lower my voltage here on the transmission line, what's going to happen to my amperage here? Going up. It's going to go up. Exactly, exactly. Whatever happens in my electrical network is system wide. Excellent. Robbie? Yes, sir. Uh, anything you'd like to add there? You hit the nail on the head. Hit the nail on the head. I, I there's kind of, what time is it? It's uh, 10.47. 47. All right, we got some time here. I might run you guys right up to 1130. Then we'll call it a day here. All right. One thing I want to check on with everybody. Are we feeling comfortable about here's the gist. 700 7200 volts in 240 out figuring ratios. What is it? One, to, one to 30. I'm going to have to in my question. Or you're, and when you get out there in the world, you're going to have to take a measurement either on the primary or the secondary to give yourself an amp value. For class, 210 amps on my secondary. What, and you'll see the question mark, is my amperage on the primary side? 210 divided by 30. Seven. Seven, excellent. Do you want to double check your work? Seven times 230. Yeah. 210, 19,900, 
480. What's the ratio? One over 41.4. One over 41.4. Taking a measurement here, I've got six amps. How many amps do I have on my secondary side? Six times 41.4. I'm going down. 248.4. 248.4. Point four. Answer. All right. Now I'm going to go on for a little bit further. Uh, yeah, I'm going to include one of these on the quiz today. We're going to change the quiz a little bit around, Professor V. Yep. Thus far, what two electrical properties have we been working with? Volts and amps. Amps. Fantastic. We have not worked with watts yet, correct? Correct. All right. Just as a refresher, I've got a 25 kVA transformer. For the Lyman's needs, how many watts output will that do? 25,000. Excellent. 25,000 watts. My output voltage is 240 volts. And we're not gonna work on the top side here, even though I could, we've learned, I can get a measurement up here. We're just gonna work on the bottom for a moment. And my amps are 271. What's the wattage? Do we remember how to do this? You said you said two seventy one what? Amps. Multiply. What what chart do I need to reference? Hold on, I'll bring it up for you. The, the answer. Ohm's law. Ohm's law. One point one two nine. Hold on one second. I'll bring up the chart for you and give you a share on. It. Open. <laughs> All right, I'm not gonna show the chart because I got this up on the screen. I'll give you the math portion of it. Power equals volts times amps. That's an Ohm's law. What's my volts? 240. And what's my amps? 271. Sixty-five thousand forty. Sixty-five thousand forty. If I know my voltage of my transformer is two forty, remember that comes standard from the factory, and I'm measuring two hundred seventy-one amps. Is this transformer overloaded? It's a twenty-five kVA. Yeah. Yeah. yeah big nice triple. Almost by almost by two hundred or more percent. <laughs> almost yeah almost triple in that case so you see the need and you know, i, I want to put this in relation to well what am i doing this for why am i getting this information from out in the field you know what what is this what is the purpose of this math for does this transform need to be changed out yes sure does yes absolutely asap okay so you're learning in this process of how to get amperage values Remember, the transformer itself comes standard. 7,200 for this transformer, 7,200 in, 240 out, okay? Now I'm able to take through ratios, I'm able to determine what the ratio is, one to 30. And if that matches my amperage in and my amperage out is correct, then I can figure wattage. Now, this is gonna be the fun part. I'm gonna give you a new screen here in just a second. This is all in troubleshooting a transformer to make sure everything is going on correctly inside a transformer. Can you see inside a transformer? No. No, all right. Are there any moving parts? No. No, no. You're troubleshooting a transformer 
with measurements of voltage and amperage and math. File, no, don't say. All right, here we go. Now we're gonna put, we're gonna couple the wattage together with the transform. And the ratios. My primary voltage, 7,200 V. My secondary voltage, 240 V. Okay. 7A. What should I be getting out of for amperage on this transformer? What should be the amperage output? 240 secondary side. Two ten. Two ten. All right, somebody give me the ratio first. Oh. One over one thirty. We're going down in math. What's seven times thirty? Two ten. Two ten. Two ten. Seven times. All right. Seven times thirty. Seven times thirty. Two ten. P equals V times I. What size is this transformer? How many watts are being used? What's being used in this transformer? 7,200. Watts, P. Oh, watts, my bad. Uh, 50,400. 50,400. So what size transformer should be here? 50K. 50 kVA, there you go. Uh -huh. You size the transformer without even looking at it. You got some voltage measurements and you took an amp measurement and you size the transformer without even looking at the nameplate, 50 kVA. How did you get 50? What did you multiply? Yeah, watch this. I took P, I'm looking for watts. I took my volts times amps, 240 times 210. What does that give me? 50,400? 50,400. Now guess what? Do I have a volts and an amps value up here? Yeah. I sure do. P equals 7,200 times seven. Give me that answer. Oh, okay. It's the same thing. Yeah, see, how about that? 50,400. Same thing. Now everything's copacetic, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Okay, I think you guys have, uh, if you got the gist of this and you got the information going on here, I think you guys have learned a lot today. Professor V, how about you? Good morning. And this, no, I'll, I'll be totally 100% honest with you. You go to Duke Energy and they're, you give them some information on a transformer and they're probably gonna be able to figure that out for you with a simple uh, radio or phone call. I know Sandy Cooper can do the same thing as far as sizing transformers and doing traditional outputs and inputs of transformers to see if it needs to be changed out. In some cases, during a storm, there have been no transformers to you, you got to kind of determine on your own, uh, what size transformer do I need to put here? And some other smaller companies, when you do your troubleshooting, you're going to have to run some math. And I can guarantee you, when you go into an organization <laughs> and they give you these skill set tests, they're going to throw some of these numbers at you. And you're going to have to determine what the correct you know, number output is as far as I, what I, I need to determine uh, watts, where I need to determine volts, where I need to determine amps. All of Ohm's law figures in this. They'll give you the chart. You need to know what you need to plug in. So this is for multiple purposes right here in your future. Okay, Professor V, is there anything else you want to add here? No, sir. Okay, anybody else got further questions? I, I still don't know how you got the 50. 50? Can you do more of that one? 
All right, let, let me, and uh, you know, I don't mind going through this as many times as we need to, and I'd like to go. I got a lot of stuff going on up here. So I'm just gonna start from scratch. Mm. File, new, don't save. All right, I've got a transformer that's on a pole. Right. I know the input voltage is 2,400 volts. All right, my output voltage is 240 volts. I can take measurements and find out this information right out there in the field, okay? I'm gonna take an amp value and get a reading for that. And I'm gonna put three amps, that's the reading that I got. First thing I need to determine, how many amps are coming out of the secondary side? First thing I need to do is find the ratio. So one in 10 is ratio. 2,400, mm -hmm. that's this number, divided by 240, that number. That is 10. Mm -hmm. Okay. This, I'm going to put my one, it's a one to 10 ratio. Now I just need to plug in my number that I had when I took for the reading. Three, I'm going down times 10 equals what? 3.3. 3. 30. 3 times 10 equals 30. Okay. okay. So there's one solution to my problem. Now you're asking, well, how did you find out the KVA? Now that I have a voltage and an amperage, by Ohm's law, I'm able to figure out power by the chart, and I'm just reading it off the chart. I've got it up here under the screen. P equals V times I. I can use either set here. I can use my voltage here at the secondary side, 240 and 30, or I can use 2400 and three. I'm gonna plug them in. P equals 240 times 30. 7,200. 7,200. 7,200. So there you go. You got 7,200 watts, which translates into a 7.2 kVA. Okay. Does that help? Does that help yeah. answer your question? Yep, gotcha. Gotcha. Are there any further? Okay. Hearing no further questions, let me look at the time here. Right on 11? 11. Yeah. Dang, I'm good. All right, gentlemen. Uh, we're going to go ahead and prepare a quiz today with this information. And uh, I will go ahead and we're going to have a recording of this also. And I'll post both when the recording is on YouTube and when the quiz is available. And that will be uh, your afternoon work. All right. The plan for Thursday is meeting back at the field at 9 o'clock, uh, weather permitting. We've got to put all of our tools together that we received from Mark Jones, all the climbing tools. And we were going to start practicing doing crossovers on the pole and more uh, pole climbing. And we'll keep you posted on that. So if there's no further questions, unless Professor V, you have anything to interject there? I just want to say, guys, um, great job yesterday climbing. Um, outstanding first day on the field. And as well, we had a compliment on you guys from our boss about your distancing out there. Appreciate you, you know, social distance as much as you did. He appreciated that. So just remember what we're saying about the eyes are on you on the field. That's one example right there. So good yeah. job yesterday. Yeah. yeah, I'll second that. I mean, I, Robbie and I have been doing this for a while now. We've got some students out there that walk into the class first day and, you know, are pretty apprehensive. You guys jump right on it and we are very thankful for it. You guys keep up, keep up the good work. All right. So with that, if there are no further questions today, you are excused. Keep an eye on your remind.
we'll be sending out when the notices for the uh, quiz and uh, video are complete. Have a good day, gentlemen. Yes, sir. Have a good day, guys. You too, man. All right, man. You too. Scott, you got anything for us? No. Nope. Yeah. I'm going to close and reopen, okay? Roger. All right.